In this session, we're going to talk a little bit about the compressed tax rates, something that came about in a 2006 special session in response to West Orange Cove II, which was a school finance uh, litigation prior to the one that is currently going on. And we're also going to talk about calculating taxes in general, and also a little bit about the state and local share of Tier 1 and kind of get a first look at that. So if we move forward, from time to time, I won't say compressed tax rate. I'll forget and fall into the acronym uh, CTR. So please uh, keep that in mind that CTR is just compressed tax rate. Now, in 2005-06, which was the base year for the system that we're currently having, uh, and, and in the second half of this school year is when they had the special session, there were 1,028 school districts. It's now 1,019 because of consolidations. But basically, of those 1,028, there were seven districts that had an adopted m and tax rate above $1.50. Now, $1.50 is what we think of as being the maximum m and tax rate at that time. But there was, was uh, a special circumstance that, that included districts in Harris County where 60 years ago, they got voter approval to set tax rates up to $2. So instead of having $1.50 for M&O and another 50 for INS, they had $2 that they could use in any way that they, uh, they chose to. And so you had some districts from Harris County, six to be exact, that were above $1.50. Now, most districts, 545 to be exact, had an m and tax rate at $1.50, and that's the reason why that there was a, a litigation, because there were a group of districts who said that we are forced to be at $1.50 and therefore have no meaningful uh, discretion to be below that, and therefore it's a statewide property tax, and that's what the West Orange Cove uh, litigation was about. But there were some districts, a number of them, that were below $1.50. Some of those were considerable amount below $1.50, but most of them were within a nickel or so of $1.50. And they were just holding back some of the discretion that they had to adopt higher tax rate because not being able to go above $1.50, they didn't want to go to $1.50 and then be in a, a situation where they were frozen there. So in that special session in 2006, what the legislature did is they said, among other things, we're going to compress tax rates. So the m and tax rate, not the INS, and it doesn't have anything to do with city taxes and county taxes, just public school m and tax rates. We're going to compress wherever you are or wherever you were in 2005-06, and we're going to compress you by a third. So your compressed tax rate is two-thirds of whatever your adopted m and tax rate was in 2005-06 school year. And so $1.50 would compress to $1.00. And if you were below that, and the example that I've given you there on the screen is $1.35, two-thirds of that is 90 cents. So for your district, you would have a 90 cent compressed tax rate. Then the state added another 17 cents on top of, where, of that to $1.17 was the maximum that took the place of the $1.50 after the compression, so everybody had at least 17 cents of new tax rate that they could go up for their meaningful discretion and to put capacity back in the system. Here are those six districts from Harris County that had m and tax rates in 2005-06 that were above $1.50 and plus there was one district, a small district out in East Texas in Russ County and it also, because of a special circumstance that it had at that time, had an m and tax rate above $1.50. And if you'll just look at Aldine there, uh, its 2005-06 m and tax rate was $1.64. If you take two-thirds of that, then you get $1.934, $1.0934. 
So its compressed tax rate was actually above a dollar, which is the most common one. So you can see here are the M&O tax rates in 2005-06 for these seven districts, and this is what it compressed to, which is two-thirds of those, of these tax rates from 2005-06. So that's kind of a summary, and the I separate that out into four categories. There's nothing sacred or important about the, the, the .95. It's, it's basically just my idea of what's a good bit below a dollar because some districts were so close to a dollar fifty that when they were compressed, they were compressed nearly to a dollar. So you have 221 districts that were compressed uh, and this is 2014-15 compressed rate, so those districts that consolidated are not included in this. So as of today, you have 221 districts that uh, were have a compressed tax rate below 95 cents or up to 95 cents, and then you have another 250 that are between 95 cents and a dollar. Most of the districts, as you see, 542 are compressed to a dollar, and there are six that are above a dollar. The reason there are six instead of seven is that Leverage Chapel was able to petition the commissioner to reset their compressed tax rate at a dollar, and so they're no longer in this list. These are just those six Harris County districts that are above a dollar with their compressed tax rate. Okay, now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about calculating taxes. Now the key point to remember as a starting point is that you have taxable value that you're going to tax. So that's the value you're going to draw your collections from to run your school. And the way our system is set up, it is a tax rate based upon $100 units. How many hundred dollar units are in that taxable value and that's what uh, the uh, tax rate is applied to. So as, just to give you an illustration, let's say you had a vacant lot and it was valued at $1,200. Well there are $1,200 units in $1,200 and if you had a tax rate of $1.04 which is fairly common these days you would take 1.04 and multiply it by 12 and that would be the taxes that I would owe on my uh, lot, uh, $1,200 lot. Now if you had a small business say and it was valued at a uh, 100000 well, now there's a thousand one hundred dollar units in a hundred thousand, so you would multiply your dollar four by the thousand, and that would give you your tax amount, the amount that you would owe in taxes. So here's some examples, and uh, if you'll look at it, uh, say that one hundred forty thousand dollars in value. You take that and you divide it by the hundred to get hundred dollar units. How many hundred dollars are there in a hundred and forty thousand? And then you multiply it by the tax rate. So dividing a hundred and forty thousand by a hundred gives you fourteen hundred. Multiply by the tax rate there, and this is the amount of taxes that are due on that property at a dollar four tax rate. Uh, going to a larger number, say a million dollars, you do the same thing. You divide by a hundred in order to get it down into how many hundred dollar units there are in a million. That's ten thousand. You multiply it by your tax rate and there's the taxes. Ten thousand and ten thousand four hundred dollars that you would owe on that million dollar property. So there's a partnership in the foundation school uh, program between state and local. Uh, the state provides money to supplement what is brought in locally through property taxes in order to fund uh, Tier 1, your basic program. And so we're going to talk about that shared responsibility and how those responsibilities are, are calculated. Now there are two values. One is your locally certified property value. That's what your central appraisal district, your countywide appraisal district uh, has established as being the taxable value for a school district. 
and those are current year values. Those are the values that the tax rate actually works on in order to determine what the tax amount is that you would pay on, your, on the property that you, that you owned. But there's another value, and, and sometimes that's referred to as the state funding value. And basically, it's the adjusted state certified values for the previous year. That's after the controller has done a study and has determined whether or not the values that were uh, set by the uh, CAD, the uh, County Appraisal District, Central Appraisal District, whether they're appropriate, whether they're accurate. And if they are too far away from what the controller says they should be, then the controller will actually substitute its values in some cases. Now, just showing a little bit of my age, I refer to it a lot as CPTD values, the controller's property tax division values as being those prior year values. But now it's uh, the property tax assistant divi assistance division or PTAD. So the state is using the PTAD values. I would doubt very seriously if you're going to have your superintendents use PTAD very much. Mostly you're going to hear them say prior year values. Now when you read it in statute, the language that's used is this mouthful right there. And that just means the prior year values, the, the state funding values, what the state uses to determine uh, funding state and local shares for a district. So let's start first with the local share, and that's called the local fund assignment for Tier 1. Uh, it's the amount of money that is given to the district in order to raise. Now what you do is you start with these prior year values, whatever you call them. You divide by 100 just like you do for the other uh, 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 calculating uh, the taxes that are owed to see how many $100 units there are. And then you just multiply it by the compressed tax rate. Regardless of what your compressed tax rate is, you would uh, you would divide it by the uh, CTR, or you'd multiply by the CTR. Divide by 100 and then multiply by the CTR. So here's an example. Let's say that your prior year values, your state funding values, are 800 million, and your compressed tax rate is a dollar. And you'll see as I go through this that I will choose things like a CTR where the math is easy. And that's so that we don't get into using lots of decimals and just confuse things. So if we're going to uh, determine what the local share tier one is for this district with the $800 million taxable value, their, their prior year values, their state funding values. You again divide by 100 to see how many $100 units there are. Then you take that answer to that number, which would be $8 million. There's $8 million hundred dollar units in 800 million and you multiply it by the compressed tax rate and in this case it's a dollar multiplied by one is very easy so we end up with a local fund assignment a local share of eight million dollars for this district here's another example in this case we still have the 800 million that we used in the prior example but you'll see that this district had a compressed tax rate of 90 cents, they were not at $1.50, and when you took two-thirds of where they were in 2005-06, their compressed tax rate is 90 cents. And the question you may be asking is that, well, that was back in 2005-06. That's a long time ago. That's nearly a decade ago. And what if a district wanted to change their compressed tax rate? And they're not allowed to. That just that one exception, which was a special circumstance where it was changed, you're, you're set at that compressed tax rate. You can't change it even if you would like to, even if your compressed tax rate causes you to have a lower level of revenue than uh, what you otherwise would get. What you did in 2005-06 has frozen your compressed tax rate, and it's not been changed since then. So you go through the same steps, you divide by 100, and instead of multiplying by the dollar we did in the previous example, 
what you do is uh, you multiply by the 90 cents, your compressed tax rate, and that would give you a local fund assignment of $7,200,000. So generally, uh, the, what's left over after the local share is the state share. So you add up your 10 Tier 1 allotments to get your sum of your district allotments for Tier 1. You subtract out what you just calculated for your local share, and whatever's left over that difference is the state share. Now, again, as I said in the last session, there's all sorts of caveats and band-aids and special deals and circumstances that have really made school finance a lot more complex than it needs to be. A lot of those things are not cost-based and they're not really justifiable, but because that happened, uh, they're carried forward as you go uh, through uh, your funding. As a matter of fact, we have one hold harmless called the Wealth Hold Harmless that was put in place in 1993. If it were a, a college student, I mean, if it were a child in 1993, it would be a sophomore in college now. So for a whole harmless, that's been around a long time. But just keep in mind that those things do exist. We're going to pass by those just to keep this simple so you have a good foundation. Thank you.